Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of All Access. It's a glorious summer Friday in New York City, and I hope you're all doing incredibly well. And uh, let's see, we've uh, I've done a, a couple of episodes with some guests. It's time to sort of wrap up all of the exciting new events in the Avalanche space. So today I want to briefly talk about two big things that are happening in Avalanche, then start taking questions and then briefly talk about, you know, whatever, whatever you might bring up. So uh, let's get started. The, um, uh, let me see, hang on. Uh, this is, um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, okay, here, here we go. That's the right, uh, right location. Let me just start viewing this properly. Um, okay. So the, uh, the big, one of the big things that was announced at um, the Avalanche Summit was Ava Cloud. What is Ava Cloud? Ava Cloud is, uh, think of it as AWS plus plus for blockchains. So whereas AWS is for launching a cloud service where you operate the, the service itself, Ava Cloud is for launching a service on its own blockchain where it's as decentralized as you want to make that blockchain to be. It's essentially subnets on the go, subnets at the click of a button. Now, what does that mean? Let's dive in. There's no code deployment that you need to perform. It's a, it's a click button uh, launch pad, if you will. You go to this one website. Um, you, uh, you just go and say, start my, uh, start my Web3 um, uh, service. And as soon as you give it the go instruction, it starts deploying and scaling a fully managed custom blockchain for you. Now, that custom blockchain can be anything. You remember that underneath we have Avalanche. So we have full flexibility of Avalanche virtual machines. Whatever you might want to do, you can run the EVM if you so choose. You can write a, you can run a Wasm VM if you like that better, or you could run any other custom VM for any specific purpose. If you want to do storage, you want to build a competitor to Filecoin, you could do that. You want to uh, store NFT data in a decentralized fas fashion, you could build that. And again, launch it. It's the same model as the ABIs on, on AWS, if you will. So you create uh, your, your image and you say go, and, and then it starts going. So you have complete customizability and you have complete scalability and per, uh, performance. So you have the performance of the Avalanche consensus engine underneath. You have all of the, the benefits of everything that we did to build very, very fast chains, the world's fastest chain, in fact. And, um, and you have the convenience now of being able to launch it for a specific purpose. That launched chain is independent of everything else that's going on. If you want to do an IoT chain, you could. That IoT chain would not have gas spikes when prices are going up and down because it's only for IoT. There is not going to be no, no DEXs on there. Um, if you want to do a gaming chain, well, then your gaming token is independent of all the speculators that are doing all sorts of funky things on other chains. Uh, this, this particular, you know, the particular chain that you launch is performance isolated, failure isolated, gas fee isolated from everything else that's happening elsewhere. This was one of the key visions or key components of the vision we launched with. The word app chain had not been invented. We came up with this concept from whole cloth, from out of nowhere, and thought this is going to be the next big thing. Everybody will want to have a particular application-specific chain. I don't like the word app chain or the word application-specific. I worked on application-specific operating systems in the 90s, so it keeps uh, conjuring up images of my PhD thesis and takes me back you know, 30 years. It's a very old word. Um, the, you know, the word app chain came after us. I still think it's a terrible, terrible name. Uh, what I do think these things are, are separate networks. They're separate chains, separate networks. And those separate networks need to connect to something uh, if they don't want to repeat all of the uh, complexity, all of the, uh, the difficulty of integrating with the rest of the world at large. That is, they probably don't want to pay for uh, integration into exchanges, integration into uh, all the other services. So that's why they typically want to be part of something bigger, and that's where the word subnet came from. And it's a common word in networking, of course. You've seen it a gazillion times. Every time you open up a router, the word is right there. It's a commonly used term. So um, Ava Cloud allows you to launch one of these at the, at the press of a button, 
And uh, once launched, these things run on their own. And um, as I mentioned, the validator set for such a chain can be as open as you like, or can be as closed as you like. If you have a private consortium open to just you know two people uh, on up, any number between between two and infinity is possible and supported. So um, your time to market is incredibly low. I think the Ava, Ava Cloud launch time is on the order of hours at the moment. Um, we're trying to bring it down to minutes. And uh, it, was, it was several hours. It's now less than, much less than that. It's just a few hours, I think, because there are a couple of things that have to happen. What do we give you? I think that's a good thing to talk about. There are four components. There is an automated blockchain builder. So you, you bring together your chain, you put together the, the various services you want to have on it on, on Genesis, and then it gets launched, kind of like, as I mentioned, the ABIs on top of AWS. You put together the, the, the sort of the services that you want um, and the initial parameters for the chain. You can then have as many managed validators as you like. Obviously, the least number is, I, I don't know what the smallest number is, but uh, uh, you know it probably could be one, actually, but I don't know if you allow it. Then you might as well run the entire service out of a single machine. There's no value to a blockchain of one. So uh, the sensible numbers are two on up. And uh, remember that this is Avalanche. Those numbers can go in to infinity. And then there are comprehensive data tools. So that includes uh, all of the tooling for, um, for scanning the chain, indexing the chain, collecting all kinds of indices, collecting all kinds of data that is going to be important and useful for downstream services. Two of them are going to be crucial to you. Wallets, you want to support them if you have your own chain. And uh, two uh, is uh, explorers. You want people to be able to see what's happening on your chain. So all of that is part of this offering. And, um, and then, of course, you get chain interoperability. You have the Avalanche work messaging underneath, so you can send a, you know, your, your subnet can talk to any other subnet and uh, send messages back and forth, and you can do so in a trustless manner without having to go through an intermediary. So this is our cloud. It takes the AWS game up a notch into a different territory. AWS is, is a client server product. It's for a client server universe. That's the universe we're trying to leave behind. That's the universe from 30 years ago, from 35 years ago. That's the universe of Zuckerberg and his services and you know Bezos and his services and et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that's the universe where there's someone in charge of a service and a whole bunch of us who are clients of that service. With Ava Cloud, what you're getting is a different architecture. You're getting this Byzantine fault tolerant, no one in charge architecture, if you so choose. Uh, or you know, whatever it is, the, the validators in charge um, uh, architecture, so that uh, now you can build servers, services and servers with nobody in charge, with a clear SLA that you know the service will stick to. So that's the big difference, entirely new universe. And there are no other universes in the uh, computer science space that at least I'm familiar with and I don't foresee them happening. So we used to have single machines those of you who are maybe 20 years older than me will remember when you used to go to the mainframes. I encountered some of these in my first few years uh, at, uh, in my undergraduate studies. You would go to the main server room and you would interact with a single machine. We left those days behind. We moved on to network machines. Well, there were personal computers in the middle, uh, but then personal computers, they're kind of like your own mainframe in a box in your den. And then we one up that into the client server model. You would go and connect with a client to a bunch of services that are remote somewhere else on the network. And the thing that comes after that is Byzantine fault tolerance. And the main thing, the main this it's been around for a long time, but the main reason why it wasn't already done, why it didn't happen back in the 80s and 90s, is because the, the underlying computational models weren't there, the tooling wasn't there, but most of all, the protocols weren't there to give you the performance you needed you couldn't meaningfully build a Byzantine fault tolerance service back then and get any kind of performance out of it. Those days are gone. We can now build performant Byzantine fault tolerance services. We can now build games where there is no one in charge and yet it feels like a regular game. It moves at the speed of, of light, at the speed of whatever the game is, the gameplay is. So now that these things can keep up with the services uh, that, that we, we've come to, to know and love, it's a different era. And that's the era that we're living in. 
So I'm super excited about what uh, what's built here. And uh, I hope uh, those of you who are interested or those of you who know people who are interested in launching their own chain will take a look. There's so much one can do with with their own custom blockchain that uh, uh, that I just cannot wait to see the creativity unleashed. And uh, so, yeah, so it's uh, it's going to be a fun, fun era ahead of us. And I'm looking forward to that. And the Ava Cloud is going to be one of the key enablers here. So, um, and I, I should say that's, uh, you know, this is far less asinine than having your own phone, far less asinine than, than whatever else. Like there are a bunch of plays you could have here that are, uh, what are they doing? They're trying to stick a coin into something that doesn't need a coin. And, uh, but this is different. This is an enabler. This is a platform. This is something for other people to excel. It's something for other people to shine, something for other people to take advantage of the benefits of blockchains. It's a key foundational service. And I'm super proud to be, uh, to be, uh, to be part of the team that, uh, that got it built. Okay, now I wanna switch gears and I wanna to talk to you about something insane and something that's really cool. It's something that I talked about at uh, the Avalanche Summit in Barcelona. But I want to give you a glimpse into what I've been thinking about lately. And it all starts out with the AI revolution that's also taking place. By every metric, uh, the summer coming, you know, the summer that we're about to enter is about, it's going to be AI summer, AI's hot girl summer. And, uh, and there is a simple reason for it because the AI technology has finally reached the point where it can actually do, uh, do interesting things where it can actually do, where it can actually implement um, really intelligent sounding services and applications. So you've seen ChatGPT. I hope that uh, many of you got a chance to play with it in the comments, you know, put your hand up if you if you have played with it. Um, it's And if you haven't played with it, you should go check it out. It's It sounds like a real human person. And, and it's come to the point where these AI agents are at about the level where they could pass the Turing test. Remember, the Turing test is one person behind a closed room interacting with, a, with, a, with an artificially intelligent agent and, uh, and not being able to tell it apart from uh, an interaction with a human. So I think we're at about that level. These chatbots are now um, sufficiently intelligent that they can produce answers to type text, to free form text. And in fact, they can do this in many languages. Now you're gonna see a whole lot of applications of AI to blockchains. Why? Because there's a bunch of money going into AI right now. There's going to be a bunch of people trying to, uh, to come up with ways to combine these two things. I have heard of quite a few of them. There are tons and tons of ideas of we're going to use AI to mine data. We're going to use AI to layer it on top of blockchains, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and it's, they're fine ideas. They're fine ideas. But I hadn't heard of the following idea. And I think I was the first one to ever mention this. Um, at least in a public forum, um, where uh, essentially this is a new way of integrating AI into the very fabric of the chains we build. Okay? There are lots of ideas where you use AI to assist. You can put AI into your wallet. And in fact, we did. So Core is going to be uh, offering something like that very soon. You can put, put AI into, uh, into the programmer's path. The programmer could specify, you know, if you're writing, a, writing some code, you say you, instead of writing it in your editor, you tell AI what you want written, then AI writes some code for you. That's okay too. But again, the AI is external to the system, external to the chain, and it produces something. And now you have to own that thing that it produced. You have to check it. You have to verify it. You have to make sure it didn't hallucinate. You have to make sure that there are no bugs in it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some translation issue there. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, so, and then you can put AI in all sorts of other things that are downstream of the blockchain. You know, you put AI in the Explorer. So when you're displaying things to the user, the AI could come in with smarts and annotate for you. It's like, oh, this looks like your transaction from you to your buddy Dan. Uh, this is a different transaction. Looks like this is for your buddy Ben, and you keep doing this every month. It's part of this, that, and the other that you do with Ben. That kind of thing. Again, it's external. So I want to talk to you about something far deeper, a far more fundamental coupling of AI with blockchains. I call it coin-operated agents or COAs. So what's a COA? It's a wild concept. 
Essentially, the core idea is that you take an AI engine, okay, so take a large language model or what have you, but take a giant AI engine that's capable of taking raw text, interpreting it, and coming up with a response to it. So you take that engine and you put it in every validator. Now you have a, and you build a blockchain with the AI engines in it. Now you have a network, you have a subnet, let's say, you have an avalanche subnet where every validator has intelligence in it. You have to pay attention to a couple of things because the blockchain, these, these AI engines have to be deterministic. They have to all act in concert and they all, in response to the same input, they have to all take the same, same steps. You don't want them uh, divergent from each other because then the state diverges. But assuming that you could, you could uh, build a deterministic uh, AI engine, which isn't hard, um, assuming that you could do that, you build these things into your validators. You start, a, a, you launch a blockchain on top where the transactions on the blockchain are expressed in an in free form natural language. There is no bytecode. There is no solidity. There is no programming. It's a no code subnet powered by AI. When you want to get something done, you talk to the validator set. You literally write in English, I want to give five AVAX to Ben. When you write it out, the ASCII characters are I space, W-A-N-T space, etc. So, you know, you just write it out as if you would write text. You sign it, you submit it. Obviously, there's going to be some data structures that the AI is capable of manipulating. So I'm not going to get into all the technical details right now, but you could imagine that there is a notion of addresses and balances underneath that the AI validators are are, uh, are in charge of. And what they do then is they read what you wrote and they take action in response. So what, what did you, what did I write? I wrote, I want to give five AVAX. Well, then the AI reads it and, and deducts five AVAX from your balance and gives it to, uh, to, uh, to Ben. We did not have to do any programming. We did not have to do anything at all. And now you might say, hey, that's kind of boring. So let's make it a little bit more interesting. I can say something that, uh, you know, in fact, you can say, hey, yo, um, my bank has been letting me do this for since 1935 or whatnot. That's called a check. Okay, fine. So let's make it a bit more interesting. I can write the following. I want to give five AVAX to Ben if and only if he can raise $5 million for his movie by end of August, 2023. Otherwise I want my money back. So now suddenly that's a different kind of transaction. That's a much more complicated thing. You could not annotate your check like that. And if you did, your bank would laugh at you. They'd be like, we can't adjudicate this. We don't have the systems. We don't have the intelligence. We don't have the power. That's right. They don't. That's because they're the ancient world. Okay. So instead, um, what we build here is the kind of thing that can adjudicate, that can carry that out. So when the AI sees this, it knows your intent. You're not specifying you know, some kind of code. You're not specifying something that some bytecode, et cetera, that needs to be verified, audited, et cetera. You're writing in English what you want to have happen. So this is incredibly powerful. That AI now can do things that uh, that uh, that uh, we only know how to express in, in English without us having to express the same thing in code. So you, me, which you know probably I know how to code. Many of you probably know how to code, but there is a vast world out there that doesn't know how to write things, how to write code, and so suddenly they can express, they can have the full power of smart contracts uh, in their native language. It doesn't even have to be English. So let's delve a little, uh, a little deeper since it's my podcast and uh, the, 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 uh, the audience here needs, it, uh, tends to be a little bit more techy than, than most. So you need a couple more abstractions around this. Uh, we have an abstraction called a sequence. So every now and then you want to start a new sequence. So, um, uh, so there is uh, the notion of transactions that are part of an existing sequence and transactions that are part of, uh, that are starting a new sequence. So, uh, the reason for creating sequences is to make sure that independent interactions don't interact with each other, that the AI don't bleed from one world to the other universe. So if you want in Kripke structures, it's called the Kripke structure in logic. It's like starting a new Kripke structure. Okay. 
So uh, suppose I start a new sequence. I say something like, hey, I'd like to create a new sequence. In this sequence, subsequent to, uh, to my prompt right now, to my transaction right now, um, what we will do is we will implement standard chess according to the FIDE rules with the initial opening uh, standard position. That already defines a, a, a huge set of complicated rules just by reference. The AI engine, hopefully in its, in its travails uh, around the internet, in its learning stages, has already learned what it means when we say chess. When I say chess, you know what I mean. I don't have to describe to you the motion of the queen, the motion of the queen of the king, and the complicated rules for the you know for everything else that happens in chess. You, somebody taught that to you when you were a kid, probably. Somebody taught that to me when I was a kid, and now I can just say, "Hey, let's play chess," and you can write exactly that in this sequence. Let's play standard chess. So that's kind of a, an exciting thing to do. the The complexity of writing programs comes from a, a variety of sources. It, the programming starts with intent, then gets translated into code, then gets translated into bytecode, and along each direction or, or at, at each step, bugs can creep in. And now we start and end with the intent, and we rely on the intelligence of the AI engine to fill the gaps for us. Okay, so I say something like, let's play chess. I move the white pieces. Uh, the, the winner, to play, you need to put up some, some money. I'm putting up 500 AVAX for this, and uh, the winner will take the purse. And I don't need to actually describe anything more than this. The AI should be able to read this and then take the subsequent actions necessary for us to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to carry out the game. So uh, it knows that white has to move, then the black has to move, then white has to move again, et cetera, et cetera. And now it, it, it has been given some context. I probably need to specify a couple, of, a couple more things exactly under which circumstances the black pieces can move. Uh, but uh, I will do that in English. If I want the, uh, the, the game to be readable, I might actually say, hey, so, so in the sequence, all interactions must be in English. That way, people reading the explorers uh, they can, uh, you know, they, they can easily read it all, all in the same language. But if I so choose, I could say, you know, write it in any language. In fact, it re requires standard chess notation. And now, now we're done. So uh, this is pretty exciting. Uh, there are other things you can do, of course. You can say, I want to start a new sequence. And in this sequence, I want to implement a lending service. What is a lending service? Well, it has a pool of asset type X and a pool of asset type Y. And if you deposit X's, then da, 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 da. There's some description of how these lending services work. You can go read the description for what Aave does. That's a lending service. It's complicated. And, um, and it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's been uh, written by a, by a large team. It has to be vetted and so forth. And the big thing that we can do here, a couple of things. One, you don't need to write code to implement a competitor to Aave. You specify it in English. You don't need to get it audited in the same manner. I mean, you do need to have people read what the heck you wrote, and, and they need to contribute ideas on what you left behind, etc., what you left out of your specification. But, uh, but it doesn't need to be audited by the same professionals who audit code. It's a different universe. And, um, and uh, what else can you do? Oh, you can do something else, something interesting. Suppose that in my description of how the sequence will operate, I left something out. Suppose there's some problem, there's some gray area. So, uh, uh, and, and now we like something happened and, um, and we now have to explore the gray area. So, um, uh, so I, you know, there, this happens all the time in legal contracts. There's an edge case that people forgot about. So now what do we do? What do we do? Well, it's fairly straightforward. You can appeal. You can literally appeal to the judgment of the AI using regular English. You just make your case like, look, uh, you know, something happened. I deposited my coins, blah, 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 blah. And the following happened. And, uh, and I want you to adjudicate the problem. And I believe the fair solution is that, well, you know, I get to recompensate it for something or another. And now you have a dispassionate engine in the middle that understands English that can come and adjudicate for you. Now, this is a, it's really, really exciting. You will not be able to find any, any person on earth that you can actually trust with adjudication. It's always, always difficult. 
It's always incredibly uh, heart-wrenching. You never know the secret allegiances. You can look at all the scandals that happened in Pennsylvania with judges. You can look at all the issues that happened with uh, with uh, various uh, uh, people that uh, that is used in, uh, uh, in 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 legal disputes to to uh, uh, to mediate. So, um, but in this case, because you know the engine that's behind the the scenes, you know exactly what it's doing, and you know that it's devoid of any human complications. So that's an amazing different, amazing and very different universe than the one we live in. We can finally get uh, the dispassionate adjudication, the dispassionate judgment, the dispassionate execution of a set of instructions that people have mutually agreed upon, people in that sequence have agreed upon, to be carried out by an automated engine we can all inspect and trust. Now, is this possible today? No. So those of you who are going to jump into the comments and say, hey, you're dreaming. Yes, yes, I know. And uh, But the dream is not that far. By the time we sort this out, by the time we start building some of these components, the AI components will have improved immensely. You know how fast this area is improving. And it's been improving that fast with human input alone. And very, very soon, we're going to get to a point where the AI engines are capable of improving themselves. And we might very well find ourselves in a universe where the pace of AI innovation is outstripping everything else. So I'm not the least bit worried about the slight gap between the vision I outlined and where we are today. If we don't start on this today, then by the time it happens, it'll be too, too late, perhaps. Uh, we are, we'll, we'll just have missed the boat. And there is an opportunity to, here to jump. So um, let's see. So as I mentioned, I think I mentioned all this. Uh, so uh, uh, no conversion for solidity or bytecode. The contracts are readable by humans in any language. And in fact, with a lending service, you might be able to interact. I mean, you should be able to interact with it in any language that the AI engine accepts. So you specify it in English, but someone comes and, and borrows money from it using their native language of Thai, let's say. And, uh, and so the explorers are going to be kind of interesting. They should probably have natural language translators inside. And um, uh, so uh, what is this capable of doing? This is capable of, in, of completely transforming the space, of totally changing it from what it is, highly technical, highly degen oriented, highly niche, um, appealing to the young crowd and somehow managing to keep out anybody who's over the age of 50 for sure, and certainly anybody in the in a, in a position where uh, they make policy decisions. They, they are not comfortable with these systems because they're so hard to use for them. But if we build this kind of an infrastructure, it's suddenly possible for anyone, absolutely anyone, to interact with, with smart contracts, to actually write smart contracts. Now, who's gonna be good at this? if you kind of think two steps ahead, is there's going to be a bunch of lawyers who are good at this. They're great at specifying contracts. So they, I suspect that people who've had legal training are going to be one of the first people to adopt this technology, and they will be the ones who are specifying lending platforms and um, you know loan platforms, et cetera, flash loans uh, written in, in English, et cetera. Now, I'm, as I said, there's a gap between where we are and where we want to be. There is research to be done. We are actively, I'm, my, I am actively uh, working on this. Ava Labs is directly funding research uh, that's, uh, that's focused on exactly this issue. And I am thrilled to see what's happening in this space. And I cannot wait to bring this to a subnet near you. And I cannot wait to see what, what you all will do. Now, obviously, that subnet, hopefully, in, at least in the initial days, will not have too much value in it. Or it can have as much value as it likes. But the sequence of people, I hope people don't put too much money into different sequences um, until uh, until we vetted them until until there has been a bunch of uh, bunch of people who did test runs etc to make sure that that the programming that the uh, the specifications rather not the programming there's no program but the specifications and the sequence uh, are are bulletproof the edge cases are covered etc etc so um, so I know that this is going to be so much fun because it really changes the game. And uh, one of the things that kind of gave rise to this, this idea, it's not just because AI has been making advances and I was thinking about how to incorporate that into blockchains, but it's because I was thinking about what to do about solidity, about what to do about smart contract programming. 
And um, there are lots of incremental things you can do to solidity. Lots and lots of small tweaks, you know, that, uh, that if you sit down and take a look, there's so many things that you could improve about it, but they're all incremental. And I thought the incremental changes don't make this language any more accessible to the next big set of users. So then the next question is, well, what does? We got to take the programming out of the, so the equation entirely. And that's exactly, exactly what we decided to do. So I'm thrilled about this vision. We're working on it. And, uh, and I can't wait to see, see Avalanche support it. I can't wait to bring it to, uh, to a subnet near you. So very excited about this. Um, at this point, I'm going to stop a little bit, drink a tiny bit of my tea, and start taking, uh, taking questions from you all. So let me take a look at this. Okay, hi everyone. When Pokemon, I love Pokemon. Everybody loves Pokemon. Who doesn't? Um, what do you want to be the best at next? Virtual machines, databases. That's a good question. You guys created the best consensus in the industry. We did absolutely nailed it. It's a huge, huge step. It's the third biggest thing in the in a in a space that uh, has been around in, in distributed systems. It's been around for forty something years. Uh, we completely nailed it. There is nobody that's that's better than us. It's the fastest. Now, from a tech perspective, what should be the next? Be what do you want to be the best at next? Virtual machines, databases, etc. I think you got a glimpse of where I I'm going at the moment. I want to be the best at combining AI into blockchains for sure. Um, but uh, but there are intermediate steps and parallel steps. So let me mention the other things that we're doing. Um, I want to offer the best wallet experience to people. Not very hard. Wallets are absolutely horrendous. And, uh, and so Core is trying to bridge that gap. And uh, if you want to take a look at uh, a mo how a modern person should interact with blockchains, download Core and take a look. Um, I want to be the best at bridges. Look at the bridge that we built. So, you know, there's this notion that bridges are terrible, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, they are. That's because, you know, go look at their code. It's absolutely horrendous. Go look at their architecture. Absolutely horrendous. Insiders can do all sorts of things, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, instead, the, uh, the Avalanche bridge is quite different and uh, quite secure, uh, and I want to make sure that it, it remains that way. Um, what else is going on? Um, best exchange. So we saw recently that an exchange is incredibly powerful and exchanges can bring the whole space down. We saw that with the uh, with Sam and his ridiculous polycule doing ridiculous things, unraveling the things that we all spent our careers on and uh, was setting the space back for, for months and years. So, so that's also another thing that, that, we, that I worked on and we, uh, we uh, spun it out of Alva Labs as a separate concern called Enclave. If you want to take a look at enclave.market, uh, then, uh, then do. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's how a market ought to be. It's a market where even the market operator cannot steal your funds, cannot front run you, cannot reveal your confidential information about which tokens you hold, how much your leverage you've used, etc. It's a trustworthy platform for people. Um, so what, what comes after that? I think what comes after that is the ability for people to launch their chains. You heard the Ava Cloud announcement. That's also going on. I'm thrilled about that. That's four different things, lots of different irons in the fire. And uh, when I came into the space, I noticed that there, was a, there were a lot of hucksters. I mean, there still are. There are a lot of hucksters. They're just in the game of repeating some narrative that they picked up from someone else. You know, you pick it up from Bitcoin, put a little twist on it, pick it up from Ethereum, you put a couple of twists on it, then you issue your own coin, and uh, then it becomes an asinine game of trying to uh, to to do whatever with your coin. Um, but uh, uh, there weren't enough people building new things, and we thought, okay, let's let's show the world what it looks like when you bring the the cutting edge of modern science into blockchains, and that's that's what we're doing. So I think that answers that question, and I'm I'm thrilled about all the things that we've built. Is consensus still the most important problem in distributed systems? No, it isn't. We so I think it's it's been solved to the extent that it can be solved with given what we know today. So if you want the fastest, you take Avalanche. If you want something slower, less decentralized, etc., then you do something else. That's fine. Um, and maybe you don't need it. Uh, so there are completely centralized systems that people use and are happy with, and that might be okay. So. Uh, uh, but uh, but consensus is as good, I think, as it will ever get 
at least in the next 10 years. Maybe there are some additional tricks that one could do on top of Avalanche. Um, I don't know what they are yet, but, uh, but we, it's, we took such a large leap forward that it will take time for it to become uh, a bottleneck again. So you're going to see us um, make a bunch of advances on other areas. Of course, VM design is always going to be important. Database design is going to be important. All the accoutrement tools that we just talked about, they are crucial, probably far more important than these components. And, uh, and so, so those all need to be worked on. Okay, what's next? Um, why? Oh, execution is not that important. Execution speeds are uh, not that critical. There will be people who come up and say, oh, you got to paralyze execution, etc." That's a trivial thing. If you want to paralyze execution, uh, you can do that. It's, you know, it's effort. It's engineering effort. I don't want to be too dismissive and say it's a two-day effort, but you know, is it a, is it a two week effort for the right person? It's a two week effort. Is it a two month effort? No, it's not a two month effort. It really shouldn't take you that long to, to paralyze execution. And uh, the benefits that you're going to get are not going to come from paralyzing execution. Uh, the, the bottlenecks now currently lie in the database layer. And so you need to address the database execution parallelization is completely uninteresting at the moment. So if you were to look solely at the platform, the bottleneck was consensus. That's been fixed with Avalanche. Now the next one is database. And, uh, and after the database layer is fixed, now we can talk about, about paralyzing execution. And after that, I think you, we all get to sit back a little bit and try to focus on other aspects of this, uh, this ecosystem. Do I think that BTC.B will be adopted by hardcore Bitcoiners? If so, when? That's a good question. So hardcore Bitcoiners, I don't know who you mean. You know, let's say laser eyes. The laser eyes are really funny people. They hate ordinals. They hate every use of, um, of uh, Bitcoin for anything other than uh, store of value. So, um, so now, that's, uh, so that doesn't say anything about BTCB. Uh, they love layer twos. So they should like BTC.B. But, uh, but will they really like BTC.B? I'm not so sure. They like the, uh, the Lightning Network. Um, and I think it's, you know, look, this is blockchains. A lot of things that happen, uh, you know, there's a lot of technical justification for decisions that are deeply social at the very core of it. And um, these, these, these social decisions are all about power and proximity to power. And um, so, so the laser eyes decided that the Lightning Network is the best thing on earth. And that it's, it cannot be criticized. By the way, if you criticize it, they'll get very upset at you. Um, regardless of how, how true and evident your criticism might be, they just don't want to hear it. So they will always reject it. Um, you know, I can go on like this to try to characterize the laser eye mindset for you. But, but really what I kind of want to do here is just remind everybody that the laser eyes are like the last of the Mohicans, they, they, they're dwindling in number. And I don't know who's, who's left, who's still got laser eyes. They all disappeared. And if you look at the audience at BTC Miami, I think somebody asked the question of how many of you hold only Bitcoin? It's almost no one. Everyone has branched out. Everybody understands that innovation is happening elsewhere in the ecosystem now. So we should not pander to the laser eyes. Just forget what they think. We know, will they adopt it? I don't know. Do I care? No. Um, do I really want to help? Who do I want to help? I want to help that person who wants to get his Bitcoin from point A to point B and wants to do it fast and wants to do it without, without concern for, hey, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Did the transaction succeed or did it fail on the, on the path of a, of a series of lightning hops? So... Um, with uh, BTC.P, you can send to someone without having to connect with them, without having to check anything. It'll just happen. If you know their address, it will get there. And, uh, and so, so that's, much, that's a much better experience uh, than, uh, than Lightning. And um, an avalanche becomes a layer two for Bitcoin. And I think that's good for Bitcoin. It takes load off of it. Meanwhile, they have a much bigger problem. The ordinals are clogging up the Bitcoin network. Uh, they swamp the space on the chain and uh, they end up uh, having to pay huge fees. And as I said, I want to help those people who want to get their Bitcoin from point A to point B for cheap. 
and I want to help those people who want to use their Bitcoin as a store of value. What does that mean? Well, suppose you have Bitcoin, BTC, and you want to, you want, you need money, but you don't want to sell it. Well, you can take your, your BTC, convert it to BTC.p, and then, uh, then borrow against it. So that's my audience. I don't think I'm pandering to the laser eyes. And the world is a large place. There can be as many, you know, there can be a bunch of laser eyes. There aren't that many. There can be a bunch of loud mouths on the internet. That never bothered me. Uh, there are lots and lots of loud mouths who are loudly incorrect, loudly wrong, loudly on the wrong side of science. That always happened, always happens. And it's completely to be accepted, completely to be expected and accepted. So, um, so I've accepted this. I'll just, uh, we'll just kind of move on and just be like, yeah, okay. So uh, if you guys want to do this, that's fine. If you guys are upset, that's okay. Um, but you can't stop other people from using the service. And, uh, and those who do get to get some value from it. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Does Ava Cloud enable the creation of computationally intensive applications with appropriately more powerful hardware that go beyond the usual finance token focused smart contracts, but still BFT? Yes, it does. Great question. You can build your own VM with your own, uh, own parameters. You are not limited to the computational limits of a typical EVM setup. You can have uh, a virtual machine um, that's a, it's a blockchain replicated proper subnet, uh, that a proper virtual machine that, that's run on a, executed on a, on a proper subnet that uh, takes large computational tasks and performs them in tandem. And uh, it could be days long. And uh, it's all up to you. You can come up with alternative charging schemes. You know, charge people to be on the network, or charge people to, to be metered, um, require every hardware uh, vendor to be, the, uh, to be identical and count cycles on the hardware if you like, instead of actually counting every single instruction or in actually interpreting every instruction. So sky is the limit. There's so many cool things one could do that, go, that breaks the mold of what people are used to. And you can do that easily on Avalanche and AvaCloud. Uh, with all the massive cloud partnerships in AWS, Tencent, Alibaba, etc., do you ever worry about any centralization risk of too many nodes running in any, any one server farm? Yes, I do. I worry about this. The more we have of these partnerships, the better the situation becomes. If it's trivial to launch an AWS, an Avalanche node on AWS, and it's trivial to do the same on Tencent, and it's, it's trivial to do the same on Alibaba, then you can do those three things and more and get a decentralized outcome. So I would be worried with just one partnership, with just one preferred partner, et cetera. Uh, well, I'm much less concerned when people have choices for their subnet deployments. Um, but as a community, we have to learn to demand decentralization from subnets as well. So subnets themselves are only as powerful as their constitution, as the way they, they got constituted and created. So uh, we would like to see them launched, replicated on a variety of different platforms run by multiple, as many parties as possible. And uh, we should, as users, demand to, to see that in subnets. And, uh, and if a subnet is highly homogenous, highly concentrated on anyone, in any one geography, in any, on any one platform, then we should not, we should avoid using it. And that's the right kind of social pressure that we should place on it. What if AI doesn't do what I asked for? Let's say it gambles in Las Vegas with my money I donated to a charity. That is a worry. That is a complete worry. It can happen, and, uh, and it's part of the development process. Um, I don't know if you saw this today. There was an interesting, uh, interesting AI post um, that came out today where uh, uh, they, were, they were coordinating AI-assisted drone technology. The drone was given a mission to complete uh, in AI, I mean, in, in natural language, and then the AI takes the natural language instructions, takes the intent, and uh, wants to convert it into uh, into action. It's going to go accomplish a bunch of missions. Uh, but there was a human; uh, the the human was powered was empowered to stop the drone. So the AI decided that the human was a potential impediment to its success, and it focused on destroying the human that is that has the red button. Before it went and accomplished all the other, all the other, uh, uh, all the other tasks. So look that up today. I just I was just reading about it prior to the podcast. Fascinating stuff, 
And um, so uh, brings us right back um, to Asimov, right back to the three principles uh, of uh, robotics, the three uh, the three rules, um, and uh, uh, and uh, and exactly how to instruct AI such that uh, they they do that which we truly intend, and and no less, no more. So um, it's it's going to be uh, we're, it's a learning process for all of us for humanity, but uh, hopefully we're going to be the first platform to to integrate AI into into a blockchain, and uh, we'll all be able to experiment with it. Script keys are cool. Yes, script key structures are very cool, and without them, you can't really express things. Um, so for those of you who don't know what the script key structure is, um, I'm sure you've seen kids, and I'm sure you've seen uh, kids who are really, really young. And when kids are young, they don't have script key structures in their heads. They have they have a single pool. So when a kid looks at something, you know, if he hid something, oh, my, that's, that's, that's not a good example. If, if, an, if he sees an adult hide something, he thinks that so he knows where that hidden object is. He then assumes that all other adults know, know what he knows, right? So there is, a, I think this is a developmental stage. Those of you who are far more familiar with this, this material than I am can correct me. But, but when, when you know, young kids have this notion that whatever they know, everybody else knows. In fact, they're constitutionally incapable of lying for some time because they think that whatever is in their brain is evident to everyone else. At some point, they realize, oh, I can know things that other people don't. And adult number one can know something, and adult number two can believe something entirely different. And, uh, and so, so that's, that's what the Kripke structure is, essentially. Different universes, different facts, different logical um, uh, primitives, axioms, as well as, in some cases, different logical, logical implication rules apply to uh, to different uh, different entities, so that that's it's a, it's a fancy way of saying that something very basic. So, um, does the world does the ecosystem need something like Gitcoin? Absolutely, yes. The ecosystem definitely needs Gitcoin. I don't know why we don't have it on Avalanche. Uh, I would love to see it in action. I'd love to donate to it. There are so many young people doing exciting things, or who want to do exciting things on Avalanche, and uh, and so. Uh, I would love to to support those things at, along with you guys, along with everyone else in Avalanche, uh, through a proper entity like Gitcoin. I would love to see it. Please make it happen. Um, is is Core going to implement Coas one day? I hope so. I hope we first implement Coas and then then we build it into into Core. That's that's what we would love to see. Uh, how do you validate that the validator is running their model correctly off chain? What happens if a validator runs their model correctly but gets a varied output versus a malicious validator? Yes, those are problems. So we have to make sure that validators that that the uh, the AI engines are are deterministic. So a well-intentioned validator should not diverge from another well-intentioned validator because otherwise, if they do diverge, they will look uh, they will look like a malicious validator. If for some reason there is non-determinism, then this, the network will fracture. Everybody else will have uh, a different opinion, and suddenly you have uh, chaos. You have a fork, you know. So it's in, in regular parlance. So, but this is not very hard to uh, to curtail. So, uh, how do you fix this? First of all, you build your your code to to be deterministic. This is doable. Um, suppose you could not build your code to be deterministic. Um, suppose there's some non-determinism. Suppose it has to have some randomization. Well, then you can use an external beacon uh, for randomness, and that allows you to fix a lot of things. And uh, the final thing is, of course, there are hidden sources of non-determinism that can creep up into code. Those of you who've ever iterated through an array in Python, you know that you know, if I have an array with uh, an associative array with items uh, x1, x2, x3 in them, you know, you can you can say for i in array, and uh, the order in which those will pop up is non-deterministic. It determines on it, it. It's determined by memory layout, and so those are the kinds of things that that have to be fixed. Uh, that's just simple engineering. I mean, there are tasks that are really really difficult, but this is not one. This is just uh, find those locations and uh, and fix them uh, through a simple transformation. 
add Dash to Avalanche. I would love to. I happen to love the Dash community, actually. I uh, have some friends there. Um, just historically ended up meeting people from the Dash community. Um, Joel Valenzuela, if you're out there, hello to you. And, um, and there are many others, of course. So, um, yeah, would, would love to. If somebody wants to, to go through that effort, uh, would love to. Um, or if Dash needs a better infrastructure and wants to, uh, wants to port onto, onto Avalanche, uh, you know, I don't actually know the Dash virtual machine intimately or actually at all. Uh, but if they want to do that port, uh, I'd love to see it happen. Um, so is Ava Labs working on a way for people to secure their assets on core without being a hot wallet? Um, what does that mean? Uh, so you want to use core, but you don't want it to be hot. Then I think you just use a ledger that's, that's, that's you just use a cold ledger. Uh, that probably means hardware. Yes, it means ledger but maybe you're working on something else. No, I'm not working on something else. Um, core is for managing your day-to-day -day interactions with chains, uh, whatever you're storing that, that you want to really maintain in a, on a secure, secure uh, device, you should do a cold wallet for. That should be off-chain. That really does require a separate device. Uh, get yourself a ledger and put those assets there. When do I think the, that crypto will see its glorious days again? That's a good question. So I made a prediction many months ago. And uh, what was my prediction from October or November? My prediction was that there is um, a lot of activity coming up in June in China. And that prior to it, we will see, uh, we will see renewed interest in, um, in crypto, in CBDCs, in Web3 from China and that this will spur uh, more openness, more acceptance for crypto from everybody else who wants to compete with China. That was my prediction. I think I nailed it. So uh, I didn't think I was this good at predicting the future uh, in general. If you, if you will, I will just give myself a pat on the back, but I think I kind of have earned the right to do this. I have you know, 30,000 tweets worth of, of uh, predictions and so forth. They're each hard to write because you have to think about science, you have to think about past patterns and so on. Um, but, um, but I did nail that prediction and I think I've been very, very good at calling out and, and nailing a large number of predictions in the blockchain space. So, um, so that's coming up. I think that started happening maybe a few weeks ago. We're going to see Hong Kong open up. We're seeing a lot of renewed interest in Web3 from China and that will cause um, a lot of other players in the space to, um, to, uh, to try to compete, to try to also open up, etc. Now, will, will we see the glorious days? The glorious days refer probably to the big asset bubble that we had during the pandemic. And, uh, and so uh, when will we go back to those days? Because we're going away from those days with quantitative tightening. And, uh, and the economy is, is going into a very different form. People are looking for... Uh, for uh, growth stocks and not uh, so for value stocks and not for growth stocks in the the equities market and uh, people don't like risky things you know why would you take a um, a flyer why would you take any risk on uh, on some risky uh, technology when you could be just uh, putting your money in t bills and getting more money uh, in the future so that's the mode we're in and uh, when will that change I don't know for that I really need a crystal ball. Um, and I would use that crystal ball and give it to an economist who knows what, what uh, he or she is, is you know, you know, the, what, the, who knows their, their, uh, their focus, their, their expertise area, and I would trade it for, for their expertise. Um, so um, I would ask them, but uh, human beings are human beings. You can't just do tightening forever. At some point, there is going to be a reversal of the trend. And uh, that reversal of the trend comes in when everybody has decided that the hour is incredibly dark, and it's super dark right before the dawn, as, as you all know. So uh, so we'll just have to wait until that happens, but humans are humans, and uh, and uh, you can't just, uh, uh, just uh, pull the reins on the economy for an incredibly long time without causing all sorts of structural problems down the line. So uh, AVAX is better off being layer two on Ethereum. That's the only way for it to survive. No, that's not the only way for it to survive, but, uh, uh, but the simple response is AVAX is a layer two on Ethereum. Right? We have a bridge to Ethereum 
can take your assets over our bridge and um, and uh, then partake in the avalanche ecosystem fairly uh, cheaply, we're very, very fast. And uh, and we're better off than every other layer too. Those things are centralized, uh, centralized boxes and we are a decentralized system. So, uh, uh, so um, they don't have any fraud proofs. They don't have any of those things. They live in a, in a world of make-believe. Again, it's one of social, social, uh, social, uh, if you will, uh, social narratives, crypto Twitter nonsense that, that people sort of uh, throw around. If you look at the technology underneath, we are the most advanced chain out there, bar none. Um, can you mention how AI can empower DAOs, DAO communities? Yes, um, AI can empower all kinds of uh, DAOs, all kinds of communities built around DAOs. Um, one of the biggest problems with with DAOs is, is um, having the right thing happen without having to specify the right thing. So, um, uh, so AI plays a key role in, in sort of embodying some common sense, embodying human knowledge without having to write it in, right? So that, that's, that's what we mean by that inherent intelligence. So uh, when there are decisions to be made in a DAO, when there are there is adjudication to be done, when multiple parties come together and they need to do something uh, in concert, and there are conflicts to resolve, then you need access to an independent agent, and that's where DAOs come in. Um, I would love to have an AI-powered oracle. That is, a DAO can have a, a, a call out to a special address controlled by somebody who's who's running AI, a singular instance of it, if you will. And it's kind of like a mediator. So what do we do in this case? So you could have your DAO operate normally in most cases, but when you run into a uh, to to a problem that requires arbitration, then you kick it out to the the AI oracle or AI oracles and see what they come back with. So um, it, ETH and BTC are the only ones that venture funds don't have bags to dump on retail. That's not true. Um, that is just not true. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know how this person knows um, what, what venture, venture funds hold, but venture funds predominantly hold BTC and ETH. That's why those, those, uh, those coins have the, the market caps that they do. So every single venture fund that I've spoken to, uh, they, they tell you what their holdings are and uh, they all start out with, we have BTC, ETH, et cetera, et cetera, or we have BTC and we have, and some of them are B BTC ecosystem only, and some of them are Ethereum and Ethereum related things only, some are different, but uh, uh, this narrative that, um, that other coins are, are, uh, are uh, operated by venture funds is incorrect, it's entirely wrong. There is probably more ETH in, in the hands of venture capitalists um, than the rest of the ecosystem combined and multiplied by some number. Oh my God, I'm, I want to wrap up and I'm getting some hard questions. What's my opinion on Web3 gaming? So uh, I think I talked about this before. I'm gonna skip this question. It's a good question. It's a question I'm passionate about. Web3 gaming is taking place even as we speak. Shrapnel's coming out. Uh, Godzilla is coming up with Off the Grid, and uh, I cannot wait to, to play these games. I've played them already. I played them at Consensus. I played Shrapnel at Consensus. If you saw me play there, then you saw me get my butt whooped by, uh, by a bunch of other people. I got sniped upon umpteen different times, eight different times or something, um, and, uh, and uh, did not manage to make it out to the, the, uh, the clear-out area. But, uh, but I had so much fun. It's such a great game. And then I played Off the Grid. And Off the Grid uh, by uh, Neil Blomkamp, Blomkamp is amazing. It's the same director who did District 9. I, I played it for a little bit, and I did not want to leave that universe. It's addictive beyond belief. And I found myself wanting, to, longing to remain there. And, and that place is now a place I know. Like, I know San Francisco. Um, I know a bunch of cities around the world. Now I know that, that, that island. I know where things are. And I have a mental map of it, and it's a beautiful place. It's just so gorgeous. So um, anyhow, so Web three. So why why are these games so compelling? Because they focus on gameplay first and blockchain second. It's not about tokens. It's not about 
any kind of yield farming tokens. It's not built around the abstraction or concept of tokens. You just are there to accomplish a mission. And along the way, the assets that you deal with, the guns, the gear, in the case of off the grid, your arm, your other arm, your legs, you're essentially just a torso and a head in this new universe. You don't want your legs. I don't know what happened. I don't know the story all that well because I didn't play the whole thing. But I think, you know, you cut your legs off and you get these mechy legs and you can swap them around and so forth and, and you earn them during the game. It's just an amazing universe. Uh, and all of those interactions are NFT interactions. But you don't know that. You, know, you just interact with them. You just stick your left arm. You pick it up. You put a new left arm on. Uh, you put on new body armor. It's, uh, it's just amazingly well done. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's how you reach out to the web web gamers or to the gamers without scaring them away. They have no idea they're interacting with a blockchain with Avalanche underneath. So uh, so I'm thrilled about what's to come. When Off the Grid comes out, I don't know. I, I certainly it's on my to-do list down here, actually. I'm going to be buying a, a full uh, gaming setup to play that thing. If I disappear from site for a little bit, you're going to know exactly what I'm doing. So... Um, uh, thank you for doing your live. Thank, thank you guys for listening. Uh, what's my take on limiting AI? Don't be limiting anything. What's my personal opinion? While the industry leaders signed the stop AI letter, those stop AI letters are, uh, are letters, are self-serving letters. Um, they self-serve in two different ways. They are signed by people who are behind in the AI game who want to slow down the leaders. They know that it's an exponential game that the people in the front will will speed up and leave the the stragglers behind so that's one reason why people sign those letters and people sign those letters and then switch around and uh, and end up end up um, end up building as fast as they can they build a competitor and the second reason why people sign those letters especially academics is to get attention to get attention to their area to to scare the public you know we're building this thing is so powerful well, look, it's just a chatbot, okay? And it's got a bunch of flaws as well. So, uh, so let's not overblow any of these 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 issues. And uh, so, I don't I don't really, you know, technology is technology. You got to be at the forefront. You got to be innovating. If you're not, somebody else is. If you have a ban on public advances, well, then people will advance in private. If you have a ban in some jurisdictions, well, people will flock to other jurisdictions. It's unstoppable. So we're on some particular path of developing this AI. Uh, it will happen whether we like it or not. The right thing to do is to remain engaged and be part of that process of development. Do I think that all DAOs should use multi-sig wallets for treasury? Yes, absolutely. Everybody should be using multi-sig wallets for their treasuries. Um, have you ever coded an algo bot to trade crypto? Yes, I did when I was a graduate student a gazillion years ago. And... Um, not not crypto sorry i have trade i have coded algo bots but not to trade crypto i don't have time and uh, i like building things that work and uh, not not i'm not a trader um oh fundraising is on avalanche this is kind of like gitcoin i should uh, mention this uh, so kit sturgeon just uh, put this in the chat um, we don't have gitcoin but we have fundraising and if you have a charitable cause, especially, or if you have a good cause that, that requires attention, then take a look at fundraising. It's beautifully built, beautifully done. And the team behind it is a, is a set of Avalanche Maxis that we all happen to love, um, who are um, they're just wonderful people. And, um, and so they put together this, uh, this funding vehicle for, uh, for different causes, different social causes. It's, it's, that's at least what it was used for when I looked at it. Definitely worth a look. Um, I will actually, in a, in a few minutes, I will go and check out what's happened on fundraising. Will XNP fun chain functionality be coming to core soon? Yes, it is. And um, uh, let me just drink my tea for a bit. What's my favorite food or dish? That's a weird question. Um, let's uh, let's go through things I love. When I was growing up, we had large family dinners every now and then, and we would have ravioli at them. So ravioli, uh, Turkish ravioli, of course. It's called manti for those of you who are Turkish. Um, I love ravioli of all kinds. So that would be my go-to go-to food number one. Now, food number two, bluefish. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. You just, uh, you know, everybody should try it at some point in their, in their life. You sit around, it's uh, those bluefish, uh, you know, meals. They take many hours. You sit down, you have your fish, you have all the little dishes that go with it. And it's just uh, an amazing experience. The bluefish you get, I've tried to find good bluefish in the U.S. On the East Coast, it's possible to find, but not very good. And I haven't found the right season yet. The stuff you get in Boston is better than the stuff you get in New York, but both are inferior to the bluefish that you get in the Mediterranean. So um, uh, finally, let me just kind of start to, to wrap up here. Um, something interesting that I read lately. Um, I read the uh, interesting article from, um, from uh, the most interesting article I read recently on blockchains was from Paradigm's research group on intents. So it looks like they are dealing with how to capture your intent around your transaction. So you want to do a Uniswap transaction, fine. You could just submit it. But in many, so these folks have been thinking about what other things do you want to specify about this transaction? You might want to specify, uh, for example, that your transaction not be front run, that it not be padded or sandwiched in a block by somebody who's extracting MEV. Or you might specify, look, I'm okay with MEV extraction, but to this level, etc. It's a very long article and it tries to sort of expand on this idea and my take on it was, was, was that, hey, this is interesting, but um, first of all, success of you know, success in the space and capturing intents uh, rests on the language in which you express the intent. So I'm gonna write my transaction. Now you want me to write some other stuff around my transaction that, uh, that is going to express what I intend for that uh, transaction when it's encased in a block. Do I want to do this? Uh, do I want to tie it uh, inexorably with my transaction? Um, that is a question. And, um, and so, so I, I wasn't, you know, I read it, it was thought provoking, but I don't know if I'm sold on the basic premise. And, um, and I also wondered like how, how, how necessary is this? So um, uh, what I think will happen in this space is that intents are really hard to express. Languages for expressing intent are very hard to come up with. So, uh, so you can't expect somebody to write a lot of code around the transactions they're submitting. So what might actually make more sense is um, essentially uh, uh, separate networks where uh, you submit your transaction to that network and the network promises some kind of a service level agreement to you that captures some course intent, for example, MEV free transaction network. You give me your transaction and I will ensure that nobody MEVs the, the heck out of your transaction. I think that's a simple use case that probably captures 90% or 99% of what people want to use intents for. And I think that's what we will see emerge as opposed to this fine grained method of, of describing your intent at, at very low granularity. It's thought provoking nevertheless. But, uh, but I, I, I thought, well, I think the, we should first see more of those cases, specialized use cases, specialized networks for, for common cases of intents before we see generalized intents expressed. Um, yeah, exactly. The problem with limiting AI is that other countries will get ahead. Exactly. They don't have to follow your restrictions or your self-restrictions. Um, the price of the token is frustrating. Um, well, that's uh, the price of the token is the price of the token. I, I generally don't discuss that. We discuss adoption here. I don't look at the price all that often. And uh, the price will do its price things. It's going to be highly unpredictable. People have looked at all of these tokens. There is no guarantee. There is no whatever else. Um, so in the long term, the important thing for me is increasing adoption. And uh, everything else follows from that. So, uh, and then in general, exactly, the crypto risk asset problem is, is indeed a problem, right? So the entirety of the space is at a certain asset price level and depending on the macro conditions and the overall economy, it goes up or down and, um, and pretty much the, the control lies with entirely with the central bankers, with the other, the, the players in the economy and not with, with the coin, uh, coin universe. So, um, 
Okay, I think, uh, what do I think about Husky merchandise? I love it. Has Kevin ever caught a bluefish? No, has Kevin has caught a, uh, a fish. Um, and uh, those of you who know that Kevin Sekniki was my student at Cornell University, and uh, he now works with me at Alva Labs, and, uh, uh, and recently caught a fish. And then he, he sent us a picture of his fish with a what looks like a homemade ruler. So there were a lot of jokes about how he made a ruler to make his to make, to make the fish big, and um, and so uh, so that's uh, that's uh, that's that's the that's the backstory of the of Kevin and his bluefish. And Luigi is asking about Turkish ravioli. Yes, uh, Luigi, it's it's not just Italians who make ravioli, and um, uh, and you should try to, you should come over sometime and, and, and I'll, I'll make you some Turkish ravioli and then we can compare. Um, not to, not to bad mouth the Italian ravioli either. I love that one too. And, uh, and those are, I, I'm not going to say anything else about that, but uh, uh, yeah. So let's wrap up at this point. Uh, thank you all for coming by. This was a long episode. I want to clear the plate on all these questions that people might have had. It's always great to interact with the audience and I hope you find these discussions useful. Um, I think you are seeing that we, uh, in the Avalanche community, are ahead of the curve in every way, just in every way. We have better technology, we're working on problems that are miles ahead of everybody else, and we're focused on the one mission that matters, and that mission is making blockchains accessible to everyone, making them much more widely used, spread, and used in a way that blends into the fabric of, uh, of society without having to require uh, cumbersome steps to get to blockchain goodness. So uh, with that, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I'm going to be working uh, quite a bit this weekend for a variety of purposes, but uh, uh, but I can't wait to, to see you on chain and I can't wait to see you take advantage of some of these new exciting things that have been deployed. Take care.